So you're probably all expecting an 18-minute sales pitch as to why you should go vegan, but I'm more interested in why people don't, because once you get animal products out of your life, they seem so destructive that the people who continue to use them now appear to be in the grip of some kind of delusion that you can no longer relate to. It's like when you click onto one of those dreadful daytime TV chat shows, you know, and you see this dysfunctional relationship being examined on stage and the wronged party is sitting there weeping into her handkerchief, in this case a woman, saying, well, you know, it's my fiancé, he cheats on me and steals my kids' lunch money to go gambling with and he drinks all day and calls me unattractive. And when eventually she's asked the obvious question, why do you stay with this? This sounds like a horrible relationship. It's always the same, isn't it? It's always, <laughs> because I love him. And that's what meat eaters are like with bacon. <laughs> this is a dysfunctional relationship in both directions. I mean, obviously, the animal products do come out a bit worse. But even for the consumer, it's really negative. We don't like to be reminded that it's animals we're eating. And so you, you never see their heads or their hooves or their tails on display in the supermarket. Then when you get this stuff home, you have to cook it because even after thousands of years of eating meat, it's not compatible with human biology. We don't have the stomach acid to deal with the pathogens in raw meat. Then we have to flavor this stuff with the plants that we're attuned to tasting because when you think about it, you can't really taste protein and fat. And so meat is really bland unless you add herbs, spices, oils, sauces. Then in the process of digestion, it increases your risk of cancer. And eating animal products overall increases your risk of several chronic conditions, including many of the top 10 killers in the West, such as atherosclerosis, heart disease, stroke. Yeah, but we love it though. This is, I like this relation. I'm having a good time. And now I haven't even mentioned the fact that farming is of course animal kidnap, uh, enslavement, rape, murder. I know this really gets people's backs up when you start using language like this, because they want to tell you, oh, you're being melodramatic, it's not that bad. But, I mean, to me, these are just the bland facts. And I think for a long time, activists have felt like, all we need to do is tell people the facts and that'll be enough to motivate them to change. Well, increasingly, People know what's wrong with animal products. And so I think we have to acknowledge that for a lot of people, it's not that they don't know what's wrong, it's that they don't feel a really strong emotional reaction to it. I think this is the majority of people. You feel like, you know, I should feel guilt about eating meat. I should feel concerned about my future health, but for some reason, still nothing. <laughs> you know? And I think there's an explanation for this. Um, if your head and your heart are telling you two different things, one of them's wrong. <laughs> and I think it's that the brain hasn't evolved to have accurate emotional acuity about stuff it hasn't seen for itself. So you could be told about a situation, and if you haven't seen it for yourself, you can still picture it really clearly with your head, but it's as though your heart has no idea whatsoever. And this is a disaster because it deprives us of the emotional feedback we need to stop us from buying products we literally don't agree with. I'm sure people are thinking, well, listen, love, you know, I've got an imagination here. If you tell me about a situation, I can tell you how I feel about it. And I am effectively saying uh, not very accurately. Because you know that phrase, if abattoirs had glass walls, we'd all be vegetarian. I think people relate to that, but it is an extraordinary admission of idiocy, isn't it? Because it means we can come up with the combustion engine string theory and relativity, but you can't quite work out what might be happening in an abattoir <laughs> for some reason. And I think you can't quite work it out emotionally. Something changes when you see it. And I presume this is because when we were evolving on the savannas and in the jungle, your emotional world would only need to extend as far as those animals and people that you interacted with yourself. And, you know, you wouldn't need to know why predators were going to attack you and get into their headspace and deal with their baggage or anything. You just need to know what they were going to do intellectually. You wouldn't need to empathize with your future self either and think, hmm, where am I going to be in five years' time? Because the process of getting older in the past wasn't about forward planning until agriculture. It was very much about surviving the moment and doing the right thing now. And if other people were eating food, that was your cue to do the same, because you never knew when food was going to be around again. So what we've got now is this very myopic perspective that is really tightly focused on the here and now. And it just it doesn't work <laughs> with modernity, because the modern world 
is like a complex web of transactions based on products that are manufactured elsewhere where you can't see them. We all think we've got this future ahead of us, but we're like rubbish at cultivating it. We get caught up in destructive behavior and addiction. And it's because in navigating this new landscape that has these two new dimensions that aren't here and aren't now, they're over there and over then, the web of acuity just falls woefully short. And a lot of what we do, I don't think we can see or feel. So you sit down to a steak and chips, and if you're not thinking about going vegan, then it's, it's ambivalence that you feel. Now, a psychopath's problem <laughs> is that they don't feel empathy. And I think our modern day problem is that culture deliberately prevents us from feeling the empathy we naturally do towards animals. I mean, you love your pets. When you go to see animals on a farm, we think they're cute. This is not an arbitrary instinct. No instinct is there for no reason. This is because, you know, we've evolved not to eat animals. And if you eat them, it turns out that meat's not that great for us. But culture provides us with this product that doesn't look like an animal. It's sanitized and shaped and flavored and, this completely belies the bloody murder from whence it came. Because if you were in the abattoir yourself, wielding the knife, of course it is empathy you'd feel then. That's what we've evolved to feel. A lot of us couldn't kill an animal at all, but for those who could, you'd still want it to be over as quick and painlessly as possible for the creature. Because you know, if, if you were ambivalent, like, oh no, I'm, I'm cool with that, it doesn't bother me, society would recognize you as a psychopath and say you need professional help. But that same society has us all inflicting these violent acts of indifference on these creatures who we know intellectually suffer terribly from the moment they're torn away from their mothers until the moment they have their throats cut open or whatever fate befalls them. And we know this is going on. So I think what we have to do is recognize that society is trying to hijack our conscience make us behave in a way that goes against our human nature and monetize the destruction of our health. If you don't recognize this feeling of ambivalence is superimposed upon you and reclaim sovereignty of your own sense of right and wrong, then industry farms you as cynically as it does the pig, the cow and the sheep. And it does it because it doesn't think we're very clever. What is the argument for eating animal products? And it better be a good one, because you know all the, the cultures that eat fewer generally are healthier. Meat made the brain grow big. Meat made us human. So they're bringing out the big guns here. You can be vegan if you want, but you're going to be less human. Now, I do hope this is an evil conspiracy, because this theory is so flawed. If it's what scientists believe, I'm appalled. I mean, the point at which we switched over to eating meat, we weren't like the chimpanzee, able to catch and kill animals with our bare hands and teeth, and able to digest raw meat safely. We obviously hadn't evolved these physical traits over a long period of time, adapting to this behavior anatomically. Because if we wanted to do it, we actually had to devise tools more complex than anything that had ever been seen before in the animal kingdom. We also had to come up with fire, because if we can't deal with raw meat now, we certainly couldn't then. And we had to have the intelligence to know that if you put meat in the fire, it's going to make it safe to eat. So it's sort of a basic version of germ theory. Can you imagine how smart a human you'd have to be now to originate all this if culture hadn't taught you it? I think you'd have to be a smarter than average modern human. So this is an extraordinary level of intelligence you'd have to have to start eating meat. It's not something that could have come from thousands of years of eating meat. We needed this if we we're going to start at all. So there's a timeline problem with this intelligence theory that we got it from meat. And, um, you know we must have got it from what we were doing before, which is eating plants. Hang on a minute, maybe we were scavengers and we just came across these well-stocked carcasses in a competitive environment of other scavengers. The lucky ape, we were known as. We just lived on a diet of serendipity. Well, I mean, I think that's a bit insulting at that point, but still, you'd need fire in order to cook the stuff, especially if it was decomposing. And you'd need the intelligence to know that this is, makes it safe to eat. So again, that timeline problem. <laughs> what if we just caught a load of fish? Because you can catch fish with your bare hands, perhaps, and it's a bit dangerous to eat. Maybe you could get away with eating it raw. I don't know. And fish contains omega-3 that's crucial for the, the brain. Now, 
I think this doesn't work either. I mean, it's a bit hit and miss catching fish even with tools for anyone that's been fishing. Also, you're very vulnerable to predators. The omega-3 thing, I just think it's misleading. I mean, it's a good source of omega-3 in the modern human diet because we don't eat many other good sources. Back then, though, we were eating an abundance of fruit and green leaves, for goodness sake. The green leaves alone would probably be enough omega-3 for the modern brain. But a lot of fruits have good ratios of threes and sixes, figs, for example. This isn't something we couldn't get elsewhere. So are there any signs anatomically that there was an adaptive advantage to eating fish and meat because if it actually shaped who we are, then we would have evolved so that we're rewarded for seeking this out. And our anatomy says the opposite. You know, we don't really taste protein and fat that well. That's why meat is tasteless. What we are rewarded for is seeking out carbohydrate because you taste sugar as sweet. You taste salt for minerals, bitter to detect poison, and then you're most rewarded for sugar because glucose is the primary fuel for the brain and muscles. And so this idea that meat's a superior source of fuel is a bit ridiculous because first the body has to convert protein and fat into uh, something it can use, which is carbohydrate. And in doing so, it loses a lot of calories. You know, that's why if you go on the Atkins diet or any high meat diet, you're likely to lose weight. So it's not hanging on to calories and fattening up the brain, you're probably losing them. I mean, from an observational point of view, this is a bit of a silly theory anyway, because a lot of animals eat fish and meat. It hasn't worked for them, has it? I mean, where are the bears and all this? Not on University Challenge. No, if we were, um, if we are uniquely intelligent, we're probably doing something different to all the other animals. And this is where the amazing work of Tony Wright comes in and his theory on how the human brain came to be, suggests that about two million years ago, we were in the tropical rainforests and we had access to fruit all year round and we're eating more fruit by weight than any other creature on the planet. Now, I know that sounds unlikely because there are a lot of big things walking around, but they tend towards the dense cellulose and the grass and the green leaves and all that. The bigger apes eat more green leaves than fruit and the smaller, smarter apes eat more fruit than green leaves. And we were eating more fruit than anything. And it's not just because it's a good source of glucose that means it's good for the brain. It's because, <laughs> as noted by Tony Wright, this is the sex organ of the plant. It's like the plant's version of a mammal's uterus, in effect. And so you can eat some green leaves and get plant estrogens. You can eat some meat and get some adrenaline, for example. This is a very concentrated, complex cocktail of chemicals that's there to incubate the next generation of that plant species. And taking in kilos and kilos of this every day creates in the body a chemical environment that is like having our DNA incubated in the womb of a plant, if you can get your head around that, because the hormones in plants trigger hormonal switches on our DNA and cause it to be read differently. And so this might account for why we change so dramatically during this period of time. We see the brain tripling in size. We see the appearance of the modern neocortex, which is the executive layer of the human brain that defines how we perceive reality and makes us human. So what happened when we stopped just eating fruit and moved on to the tubers and the meat and all that? And by the way, I would suggest that since meat and potatoes or whatever, tubers at the time, are more difficult to gather, more difficult to make edible, you have to cook them, and more diff and sort of less appetizing. These were probably fallback foods that we didn't want to have to eat, but perhaps there was an environmental problem with our fruit supply, and there are many theories on that, and that makes sense to me. Why would you go after this stuff when it's so much more difficult? And at this time, it looks from the fossil record like the brain stopped expanding. Now. The fossil record is patchy, but what we do know is it's been shrinking dramatically for a very long time and not slowly. We've lost a tennis ball's worth of brain in the past 30,000 years. It's a golf ball's worth in the past 20,000. You never hear about this, do you? What Tony Wright says is happening is that when you don't get the fuel you need, and this is massively expensive, the brain's going to steward the resources it does have to those areas that are absolutely crucial to your survival. So the primitive instincts of fear and control. It's going to have to sacrifice the stuff that's not essential, so things like empathy, creativity, self-awareness. And 
you know, what I find fascinating at this point is the work of places like Johns Hopkins University, where they look at the action of psychoactive drugs in the brain, and they observe that things like psilocybin mushrooms and stuff like that, which I know are illegal, so I'm not advocating the use of them, but under these um, conditions, they seem to sort of reduce activity in the corpus callosum that joins the two hemispheres and allow for connections to be made that aren't normally, in effect, lighting up dormant circuitry. And the subjective experience is more empathy, is more creativity, sometimes more self-awareness, where people say, wow, that's where I've been going wrong in my life. I didn't know that before. And I find that fascinating because... These are the things that make us human, and what Tony suggests is happening is that we're reverting to a standard mammalian model of brain that is very good at surviving, you know, and is cheaper to run, but like not so great at a dinner party. <laughs> so, anyway, that's my reaction to these scientific studies. It's obviously my personal opinion. I don't know what the scientists would report back. What I do know is scientists aren't massively worried about the rapidly shrinking human brain. <laughs> They say, look at culture, that's, that's proof that we're getting smarter all the time, which seems to me a little unscientific. There's no correlation between intelligence and brain size, now the brain's shrinking, even though there was when it was expanding. And I'm like, you know, yes, culture looks like progress, uh, of course it does, but this is the same culture that is threatening our habitat, that is causing a wave of cancer, obesity, things like depression, that's saying to young people, if you want to continue the cultural enterprise, we're not going to help you, we're not going to hand any resources down, you know, you can pay us, we're going to treat you like a business. Have you noticed this? <laughs> I mean, so a lot of behaviours in our culture seem quite threatening to the re resilience of our species. They don't seem to be supporting it. This might not be the progress we think it is. I mean, I personally even think art might not be the progress we think it looks like. That could be the point where pictures in our mind were becoming evanescent and we were trying to externalize them because they were disappearing. Who knows? I, I find this a fascinating area of study um, because if we have a problem with our perception that underwrites everything we do and dictates where we can go as a species, Tony Wright is making amazing strides in this area and has a lot of support from scientists, some of whom are evangelical about it. But I hope awareness of what he's doing just grows exponentially, because it does feel at the moment like, you know, the future of humanity is hanging by a thread from this one bloke in the Midlands. So, <laughs> fingers crossed. What do we do in the meantime? Well, a high carbohydrate, low protein, low fat, whole foods, vegan diet seems a good approximation of what was beneficial for brain health historically. This is also the diet advocated by a lot of doctors like John McDougall, Neil Bernard, Michael Greger, Dean Ornish, the Esselsteins, T. Colin Campbell, as just useful in for human health. It seems like the natural diet that therefore brings about the conditions of good health in the body. But aside from that, just being vegan is so useful in terms of society because when you exercise that muscle of empathy towards a voiceless group, animals, it means that every time you sit down to eat a meal, you're forcing yourself to look beyond your own selfish wants out to the bigger picture. And as the wider world emerges to you, you can see that it's something worth your attention and something connected to what you do. Because I think we forget that when we criticize politics and culture and education. These things are weather vanes for what we say is permissible and who we are. So I think it's waking up to this bigger picture that's going to change society, you know, when we realize it's what we do. And so the vegan revolution is a cultural revolution. It's not something we are going to leave up to politicians, educators, and scientists. This is a battle we can fight and win in our own homes with our own knives and forks. Thank you. Thank you.